Wendell Pierce is one of the most accomplished actors in America today. You probably know him from The Wire, Suits, his role in Jack Ryan. We flew down to New Orleans to talk to him about what it takes to become a great actor, but also his love of that city and his time there in Hurricane Katrina. <laughs> Wendell, I it's so good to see you. So good to see you. Welcome it's to been, New Orleans. Thank you. It's thank you for having me to your hometown. You. Oh, thank Last you. time we met was in LA. I'm much happier that we're meeting here. Uh, yes, and and that was beautiful. You suggested the World War II Museum. Yeah, I suggested it because uh, <laughs> my, my dad fought in Saipan during World War II, and uh, it really uh, made an impact on me. Yeah. You know, he, he would talk about it briefly, and then he went through some things, uh, some challenges afterwards. Uh, showed you how to deal with uh, adversity and so it taught me a lot and so I like to come here as it expands uh, it really shows the uh, sacrifices that people made that the country made uh, it really shows you how to sturdy your character it's an incredible uh, museum look at this amazing yeah. design it's a cool it's a great building. architectural design it's very cool I gives you an this. idea of the planes and the warships yeah. that were there. And, and the was, rain held off for us. And the rain held off for I us. I had a horrible feeling we had a big storm coming. No, no, no. Not for you, Kat. <laughs> so, Wendell, you've been in an extraordinary number of hit productions. Jack Ryan, The Wire, Suits, on stage recently in Death of a Salesman. Yes. Is there a... A, a method to the way you choose your parts? Um, good writing. Hmm. I, I tried to do projects. I used to be a theater snob, you know, when I first <laughs> got out of conservatory. What is a theater know, snob? You know, when you're getting out of Juilliard and you're like, I only do theater, you know, uh, uh, the trite work that is on television. Only Shakespeare is good enough. Only Shakespeare and Chekhov. And, you know. and, and, uh, and then I realized, you know, uh, you can go broke that way. <laughs> but no, I started to realize the thing that uh, the common denominator is really good writing. Mm. And I was very fortunate to see that, especially on The Wire. And is it fair to say that The Wire kind of catapulted you to a, to a different level of uh, not only of fair acting to say, like fame, wealth, yeah, yeah. credible, everything? Yes, not only, uh, you know, accurate, it, it is truth. You know, it is uh, absolutely truth. It is the thing that put me on the map. How did you prepare for the role of Bunk? I actually met the real bunk, right? Oscar Requeer, who was, uh, who was a detective in the Homicide Division. And um, I, he, at the time, was working the courts. You know, he was near uh, the end of his career, and uh, he was taking me around, uh, introducing me to all the other officers, talking about cases and talking about uh, police work. Um, then I met some officers of the Western District in uh, Baltimore, and I, w I did ride-alongs. Um, and uh, watched interrogations uh, or interviews. I shouldn't say interrogations. <laughs> they would be on me about that. Uh, and I noticed uh, that they were students of human behavior, like actors, you know. Um, the cops. The well, cops themselves, yes. Mm -hmm. Didn't you even take part in an interview? Uh, I think I'm yes. not allowed to call it an interrogation. Yes. In an interview uh, it of a was suspect an interview. Once. He said, uh, I'm "Not sure how. I'm not sure how legit that is." It, by the it way, wasn't, they it wasn't drag legit, you and have you play uh, a police officer. And I won't. I won't ever say anything about the officer that did it. Yeah, uh, I was on a ride along. I was on a ride along, and uh, we went to actually interview someone who had been robbed, and they went to get information on you know uh, who you know what, where, how, who, any you know distinguishing marks on the person or their clothing or whatever. And then they turned to me, I was just sitting there, um, and they said, uh, Officer Pierce, do you have any questions? And I was like, uh, what did he look like? You know, who was he? I, went, I was like, you can't do that. He said, no, I wanted you to get the feeling, you know. That's and role I, play. That is, that is method acting. Uh, that was method acting. You said something a minute ago, which is that cops are students of human nature. Yeah. And actors are too. Yes. How are you? How are you studying human nature every day to bring what you observe in people into your roles? 
Well, what what does that um, mean for you? Well, it's not, it's not as if I'm going around watching people uh, astutely all the time. When you study a script, no one has to tell you how to feel when you lose a parent. Um, when you study a script and you realize that uh, Cordelia watches her King Lear die, you have to create that world in your heart, in your mind, and in your spirit so strong that it induces the behavior of acting. So everything that you feel comes to that moment yes. and allows for that moment of acting. And if the moment isn't there, you haven't done enough work yet. Right? Mm -hmm. There's moments in the play or in the film um, where you have to, where, where you're in love with someone. You know, you start with the circumstances of the, the story and the script, but then you start just looking at the other actor. You know, she laughs funny. I love that about her, you know. Um, she has, uh, she, she has this beautiful way of, you know, closing her eyes and relaxing, you know. Um, In that moment, do you, Wendell Pierce, almost really feel you love the other actor? Yeah, that's why it's always dangerous, <laughs> you know. I, I try to, I try to go there, you know. I, I, you know, I always find something, especially if we have a loving relationship, I will, I always find something and uh, the other woman, or it, I've been in situations where the, the man uh, that you find loving, that you would find attractive in them. You know, it's, if, if, if you're gonna be a student of human behavior, you go for it, you know, you go. Uh, and sometimes, uh, <laughs> you know, it's dangerous because you don't want to have an affair or anything, you know. Um, oh, yeah. I'm not gonna push you there, Wendell. Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll... I'm in trouble already. So this museum is special to you? Uh, yeah, I, I love this museum because uh, it kind of connects me to my father's youth. Uh, he was drafted into the war at 17 and um, uh, not knowing anything about what he went through or uh, all the challenges he had, um, the fears he must have had, this is a way for me to connect back to who he was as a young man. Tell me the story, Wendell, of your dad and his medals. Oh yeah, well, so my medal, the, the, my medal story. My father was uh, in Saipan and when he came back from the war, he was being discharged uh, and his papers were behind him and he told the discharge officer, I think we got medals, um, but my papers are behind me uh, and... So he'd been told that he'd yeah, received he had a medal for his we, services to they, the country. That they got several medals for their battle in Saipan and uh, it was a uh, white female officer uh, who didn't believe him. They said, yeah, right, you. How could a young black soldier get a medal? Uh, get a medal? And uh, he harbored <laughs> a lot of anger and resentment for that. And um, it was years later that my mother came to me in 2010 and uh, said that the army sent a letter saying uh, that your father got his medals. We should really get his medals. He's in his late 80s now. Um, I said, yeah. She says, bring me the letter. And she brought me this yellowed piece of paper from 1945. So the, so the letter hadn't come in I thought it had in been a recent letter. Right. Yeah, no. And it was a letter from He'd always January 1945. And uh, he had harbored that resentment. And I said, I'll get you. Mm -hmm. those medals and with the help of uh, our state uh, our state senator at the time and this museum uh, they got him his medals and not only got him his medals they had an award ceremony for him in the first pavilion and uh, he penned my brother when he graduated from West Point mm -hmm. and so my brother came back and we penned him his medals then had a reception and all and uh, a few weeks later they honored him again at the Spirit Awards gala here at the museum and he said I've seen a lot you know, I didn't get my medals and this museum helped me get my medals. It's, uh, it really means a lot. I never thought I would see a black president. And I've lived to see a black president. And you know, this country has gone through a lot. And uh, just, I just want to say, God bless America. And he saluted the audience and I'm in tears. <laughs> uh, 
And I'll never forget there was a Medal I, I of Honor. I and I wasn't even there. There was a Medal of Honor winner sitting at the table uh, with us. And I was like, God, I, I never knew my father could give a speech like that or whatever. And he turned to me and said, where the hell do you think you got it from? <laughs> I said, you're right, sir, you're right. So it's, uh, so it's a special place. I mean, your dad could easily have felt, you know what, I, I risked my life for this country that wouldn't even give me the medal I was due mm -hmm. because of the color of my skin. And you could imagine him thinking, you know, having resentment about America, mm -hmm. but he didn't have that. He didn't feel... He did, but it... It, it made him uh, commit even more to what the, the values and the aesthetic of America is all about. You know, that, he's, he's one of those true patriots. You mm. know, he loved his country when his country didn't love him back. You know, when I think of America, it's not apple pie mm. and baseball. I think of my descendants on the, the values of uh, Assumption Paris, who found a way to pull their money together to buy land after one of my uncles was lynched. He did not die. We, he, the family sued and actually won the money to buy the land. So we got, which to this day grows sugarcane and is our family homestead. It's the resilience, it's the, the brilliance The land that. that your uncle was lynched on. The, in, 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 the, the, in the parish, to buy. yes, yes. And after all that, your dad still came to this museum. Yeah. And he stood there and saluted this country. I saluted this country because uh, of what we made of the country ourselves. That's the thing. That's the thing about it. I remember one time we went to a boxing match and during the uh, Black Power Movement, you didn't stand for, the, for uh, the national anthem. And we went to a boxing match and stood uh, and right in front of us was some young cats. I was a kid, and they pulled on my, uh, some young brothers pulled on my dad's pant leg and said, oh, you know, sit down, pops. You know, we don't stand for the national anthem. He goes, no, man, you know, don't, don't pull on my leg. He said, man, sit down, sit down. He said, hey, man, I fought for that flag, so I stand for it, right? He said, man, sit down. He said, listen, I fought for that flag, so you can sit your ass down, right? Mm -hmm. You sit down. But I'm going to stand up, and if you touch my leg again, I'm going to kick your teeth in. <laughs> I'll never forget that, right? He wasn't mad at them for sitting down. He was like, that's right, protest. Do that, young blood, but I'm going to stand up because this is what I did. Mm -hmm. You fight your way, I fought my way. We're all going to get there some kind of way. And that's what he taught me, that there's a dexterity to the, to the conceit of what America is, right? And don't let anyone else tell you um, that your pursuit of liberty mm -hmm. is wrong. When you played to the role of Robert Zane in Suits, mm -hmm. I can't imagine for a second that you thought you were going to be playing the dad of a future princess of yeah, right. the royal family of England. How I, weird was that? I didn't believe it, you know. Like when everybody was aware that uh, Meghan was dating Prince Harry, I was like, man, you guys are making it up, you know. And then one day I showed up on set, we were doing a scene, and uh, she was engaged. Uh, in the show and uh, wasn't engaged yet. Uh, and we were in a car, we were about to get out of the car and they said, no, stay in the car, stay in the car. Uh, they said, we have a paparazzi down the block, you know, with long lens. And if they get a shot of Megan with that ring on, it's gonna be, you know, it's gonna go around the world instantaneously. So Megan, take the ring off. Go, okay, now get out. And I said, wow, you guys are going through all of that. And then when we got out of the car, there was this rock solid secret agent MI5 guy <laughs> security that took Megan and whisked her off. He said, I'll take it from here. You know, and I was like, I heard the British accent. I said, oh, oh, it's real. It's the real deal. And uh, they sent security over. And they had, they had uh, security. And that's when I knew they were dating. Okay, you've taught acting, right? Uh, yeah, I've tried to. Mm. I want to try to learn something. Okay. How do I say New Orleans? Uh, it's the hardest city in America 
for a you, foreigner to pronounce. If you think of the French rhythm, Orléans. Yeah. We have the French rhythm without the French sound. New Orleans. So that's the way to think of it. New Orleans. I thought so it, think of Orleans now. Okay. I knew uh, it wasn't There that is simple. the tourist trap of New Orleans. Nobody down there says New Orleans. But it looks good on a t-shirt, right? <laughs> N apostrophe A-W-L-I-N-S. New Orleans. I went to New Orleans. Nobody says that. And then there is an unwritten rule of you say New Orleans to rhyme in a song or a poem. Do you know what it means to miss New Orleans and miss her each night and day? And I tell you what's more, when you miss the one you care for, more than you miss New Orleans. Pops, Louis Armstrong. Very so nice. that's the rule. That's your acting lesson for okay. the day. N New Orleans. New Orleans. New Orleans. There you go. I have a funny feeling I'd be taken for a tourist anyway. I opened my <laughs> yeah. eyes downtown. Um, New Orleans is important to you. Mm -hmm. You grew up here. You were here the night before Katrina hit. Yes. In fact, you would have been here with a hangover yes. when Katrina hit. If I came your family down, had not persuaded you to leave. I came down for a family vacation. I was mm -hmm. uh, meeting family here. I got to the city and there was all the hubbub at the airport. I said, what's going on? They said, the, the hurricane. I said, the one in Florida? They said, yes, yeah, coming here. And I'm like, oh, no. And uh, I went out that Saturday night, you know, and my mother was concerned we should leave. I'm like, oh, this, we don't have to leave. It's just a hurricane. We've stayed through many. And I gave the ultimatum uh, that, you know, if they call a evacuation if they call for a mandatory evacuation which had never happened in the city before and that's why I thought I could say it um, if they call for a mandatory evacuation we'll leave the next morning they called for a mandatory evacuation it's like my mother called my bluff really she said we're leaving I had gone out that Saturday night and uh, brought up the Sunday morning sunrise <laughs> so I was tired and hung over and um, we were packing the cars. Uh, my nieces were here and my sister-in-law, my mom and dad, and I'm packing the cars. And I'm like, I'll stay, you guys go. We were going out to relatives outside the city. And I said, you go, I'm going to stay. And I went to sleep. I woke up a half an hour later and they were still packing the cars. So I said, okay, I'll leave with you. If you guys are still here, I'll leave. Had I not, I would have been in some of the deepest flooding of the city. My neighborhood of Pontchartrain Park uh, had 20 feet of water and sat in it for two months. Um, we you lost, lost friends. We lost nine neighbors. Mm. We went to church that Sunday morning and the Bynums, they lived around the corner from us, an elderly couple. and. Uh, my father said, are you guys leaving? I said, no, nah, we're going to stay. He said, no, nah, we're going to leave. I said, all right. Well, you know, you guys take care. And that was the last time we saw them. They, f they found Mr. Miss Bynum in a tree. So the desperation of trying to uh, leave the water, you know, escape the water, she had climbed into a tree. And the tree fell over into the flood. Um, it was, so I always think of them and uh, how I wish, how I wish they had left, you know. Um, and so thankful that we had. I always think that I stayed, maybe I would have gotten around the corner to save them, but uh, may they rest in peace. You brought your parents back to your house eventually. Yes. And it was trashed. It was destroyed. I'll never forget uh, driving back into the city when we were able to finally get back to our neighborhood. It looked like nuclear winter. Everything was gray. Everything was destroyed. Um, and we finally got to the block and turning on to the block to see our entire block destroyed. My 
parents broke down in tears. It was like the death in the family. And uh, it was funny. Uh, gallows humor, I guess. My mother tried, told me to try the key. You know, I was like, it's not going to We're going to kick the door. And she's like, don't kick the door in. Just try the key first. You know? uh, and I had to show her that the key wouldn't work, you know, because the house was <laughs> destroyed. And, and she said, okay. And I said, kick the door in. I had a friend call me uh, who got in before. And he said, when you come back, make sure you're here with your parents. Because the first sight of it could kill them. Uh, my father was 80. My mother was, you know, in her late 70s. And at the end of their life, in the golden years, to lose everything. And my father just wept and said, this is our whole life. We raised our boys here. We raised our boys here. So I knew my goal was to get them home before they died. So I really worked hard to rebuild the home uh, as fast as possible to get them back. And I did to the point that they were like one of the few people back in the neighborhood of a thousand homes, maybe just a few people. And then neighbors said, Wendell, you got your parents back, you know. Um, the neighborhood is never going to come back, but you can bring attention to it. You know, we, we have to rebuild. And uh, then I realized that so much had been done to build that neighborhood. It was one of the first black uh, neighborhoods post-World War II in a segregated New Orleans who could not come and just buy a home anywhere. Uh, and because of the civil rights movement, this neighborhood was created. My parents, like a Moses generation, had created this sanctuary. And I knew that I had a responsibility as this the part of their Joshua generation to rebuild it. And so I put together a, uh, I put together an effort of residence and we rebuilt our neighborhood brick by brick, house by house, block by block until we returned. And now we are on the register of Historic Places, on the National Register of Historic Places, Pontchartrain Park. Thank you. That was great, Wendell. Thank you very much. Thank you.